Hello, it's David Hoffman, filmmaker, with a clip from 1998 about electric cars. And the reason I'm presenting this clip is because I've had a clip on my YouTube channel for a long time about electric cars from 1998, which gets a huge amount of views and a huge amount of comments. And I haven't really responded by showing you the film that this clip is from. So the time is 1998. I get this wonderful job from Honda. Honda is about to come out with their electric vehicle. I think Prius had come out the year before, 1997. Chevy has the Volt coming out. Why are they doing this? You probably know because of air pollution. California passed a law that said cars had to be more pollution free. And uh, I think 12 states followed and everybody starts coming out with an electric vehicle. So Honda hired me to make this film about electric cars and about the internal combustion engine. Well, from the time I was a kid, some people knew about internal combustion engines, but other people like me didn't. I never really paid attention. I didn't know how the damn thing worked. Turns out that at the start of the 20th century, you may already know this, electric vehicles were a big deal and they were gonna really take out the internal combustion engine, which required you to crank up the car until somebody invented an electric motor, starts the car with a button. That was the end of electric vehicles until air pollution. So this film that I'm about to show has some visionaries in it and an incredible moment in American history. We're headed towards a time of all electric vehicles. I love the internal combustion engine, particularly after I made this documentary. Take a look. If you're interested, I'd like to know more about what you've done with electric cars between 1998 and now. You are looking at a 16th century cathedral, a monument that philosopher Roland Bardas once compared to the car. He said both were the supreme creation of their time. No invention has captured the spirit, the freedom, the mobility of the 20th century like the car. And no place in the world has ever been more in love with the car than Los Angeles. Sure, every city has car lovers, but if one city has come to be known for its car lifestyle, it's LA. And if one city has come to be known for its car pollution, it's also LA. Los Angeles became famous back in the 1970s as the smog capital of the world. The famous Los Angeles skyline is buried somewhere underneath this layer of pollution. The Air Quality Management District predicted that smog would reach second stage levels today for the third day in a row. Now, if a third stage alert should become imminent, then all government, business, and industry would be shut down, and the seven and a half million people living in greater Los Angeles would be asked to stay at home. Will that ever come to pass? It's hard to say. We'll have to wait and watch through dry, red, irritated eyes. For News at 10, Tony Valdez. I know what's wrong with your truck. It's your quote unquote pollution control. I heard on talk radio, you don't even need them. They're just an egghead government plot. How is cutting down on pollution a government plot, Dale? Open up your eyes, man. They're trying to control global warming. Get it? Global. So what? That's code for UN commissars telling Americans what temperature it's going to be in our outdoors. I say let the world warm up. Pollution was affecting every city in America, and the most affected was Los Angeles. The significant tactics that we plan to utilize in the implementation of the plan to reduce hydrocarbon emissions. Which is in 1997, Californians passed an amendment that challenged the auto industry, requiring that by the year 2003, 10% of all cars sold in California be pollution-free. Hobbyists and scientists and car companies and students have taken on this challenge. To understand what they are doing, you must first understand the car and its engine the much-loved and sometimes hated internal combustion engine. O oh, engine so grand, built of our human hand, true muscle of steel, your powers unreal. 
Your spark plugs wait for the gas that's their bait. With valves open wide, which in one great stride let in the fuel that powers the car that replaced the mule. Combustion, combustion, fuel mixes with air that sparked by a flame explodes with great flare. And out comes fire, pushing pistons to go up and down, down and up, up, down, down, up and the crankshaft cranks turning wheel to wheel, and the mighty car moves, making our freedom real. This poem is here to honor you so, for eternally keeping us on the go. I mean, when you think of a comparison of an, of an automobile to anything else, whether you buy a television set or a kitchen or anything else, it's an incredible uh, uh, machine with technology that is, that is space age. There was a time here in, in the 30s where you had to have a, a valve job every 10,000 miles. And you were lucky if you could take a weekend trip without a, changing at least one tire. That, that has changed completely. The car engine has been steadily changing. But to understand how, you have to know a little more about it. Well, we have two cylinder heads for this engine. We'll take the cylinder heads. First thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, put the core plug in the end of it. This is Jim Brown. He understands engines. Jim is one of the few people around who can still put an engine together from memory. Just watch. You know, a car engine has 20,000 parts. That's five times as many parts as a jet engine. Of course, when Jim Brown was young, more people could do this, no sweat. But maybe that's because the engine was a lot simpler then, before computers and fuel injectors and overhead camshafts. This is a six-cylinder engine. You can see its cylinders. This is a crankshaft. Each time the crankshaft turns, which is 40 times per second, six explosions occur. Think about it. That's 240 explosions per second, all encased in this piece of metal. It's powerful and it's safe. Most of us as we are driving never think about the incredible engine that's beneath the hood of our cars. Okay, what we have here is a finished engine ready to be installed in a vehicle. There was a time not so long ago when many boys and some girls too could take an engine apart and name its pieces. For 99% of us, those days are gone. But every once in a while, you'll find a group like this, students who are driven to learn how to make engines that are powerful and clean. This is the intake. Well, this is the intake manifold here. This is where the air goes into the engine we were talking about earlier. And of course, everybody's familiar with their air cleaner that they should also service when they get a tune-up. When they're driving dust. And the air cleaner is over underneath. In this box. In that box. And the air comes around the bottom of the box, comes in, and this computer piece senses the air coming through into the intake. As the piston rises in the cylinder on compression stroke, the spark plug will fire. The spark plug is here, deep in the cylinder head, so that it's exposed in the combustion chamber. And this is the spark plug wire. So. This is the spark plug wire, which comes back here to our distributor. distributor. Once the fuel and the air mix together in the correct ratio, 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 get in the combustion chamber, then the spark plug's gonna spark and the right ignite, time. Fuel. ignite the, the fuel air mixture, which produces, produces the heat. And the power. Move the piston sure. down. Move the piston down. And we put the ball in, and that's like our piston in the cylinder. And just to make it safe for everybody, we'll put this little tube over because we're going to generate some pressure in there. So now we hit the spark and so the ball being forced out of the cylinder represents the piston being forced down in the cylinder, exerting pressure on the crankshaft, turning the crankshaft, which turns the transmission, which ultimately turns the wheel. rear wheels. Wheel. We have to clear the exhaust gas out of the cylinder like we did out there so we have compressed air 
and that's going to drive all the hmm. burned gases out of the cylinder, just like the piston going You're up on the exhaust. Can yeah. You can smell the hydrocarbon vapors. What these students and Professor Sullivan like are talking engine. about demonstrate the problem. This is like an engine. Burning fuel in the engine moves the piston and then the crankshaft, which moves the car. But the fuel is not all burned. Something is left over, the exhaust, the emission. And what comes out of the tailpipe affects every living thing on the planet and the planet itself. What is gasoline made out of? Oil. Oil. Oil, Oil. but we want to get down to what it really is. Uh, carbon. Carbon is one Hydrogen. Of them. Hydrogen. That's the other one. Gasoline is a hydrocarbon, not oxygen yet. That's oxygenated fuels. That's alcohol. Gasoline <laughs> is just H4 carbon. Hydro or carbon. carbon. Hydrogen. <laughs> Hydrogen. <laughs> and C for carbon. 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 That's what it is. So when hydrogen combines with oxygen, it produces Con. water, water. Actually, water. When carbon combines with oxygen, we want it to produce CO2. CO2. This is what we call. <laughs> Complete, complete combustion. Combustion. That's what Perfect. we want. Complete combustion. This is what we want to come out of the tailpipe of the car. And this is what we work so hard with our electronic fuel injection, electronic spark timing, four valves per cylinder, engine design, to try to have all of this happen in the combustion chamber. But it doesn't, because life's not perfect. perfect. So it's we always don't a catch. always get perfect, complete combustion. Things go wrong. wrong. We've now seen in about 20 different cities in North America associations between daily changes in how much carbon monoxide is in the air and people coming into hospitals with congestive heart failure. Up in here is the exhaust manifold coming down to the exhaust pipe. And we, admit, we mentioned that the exhaust gases eventually get to the catalytic, catalytic converter. converter which is where we're going to reduce the emissions. final emissions that we couldn't take care of in the engine. In the engine, not all the gasoline got burnt, the hydrocarbons. And some of the carbon atoms didn't burn completely. They formed carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. And we did the best job we could in the engine to get them to burn, but some of them make it into the exhaust pipe and get down here to the catalytic converter. In the catalytic converter, in the presence of the catalyst, which is in probably this one is platinum or palladium, the hydrocarbons are encouraged to burn. The estimates say it's reduced emissions by 80% of a, of a 1974 car that didn't have a catalytic converter to a car that has a catalytic converter. Um, and the new cars, I mean, we have cars now that are called zero emission vehicles because under 90% of their operating range, they're producing no pollutants. To uh, demonstrate the importance of emissions, what we really brought together here is a 1954 Cadillac and a 1998 Acura because the transition from a 1954 to a 1998 is a tremendous amount of technical advances that have gone on. This car is, of course, state-of-the-art 1998. It's got everything you can imagine to control emissions, including computerized fuel injection. If you take a look into the engine compartment, you can see how simple things are. No air pump, no catalytic converter, the minimum of devices to control emissions. Let me put this pipe in right now. This is a to be legal in the state of New York, pipe. this car it cannot emit more than 220 hydrocarbons per million. Uh, to pass in New York State is 1.2 and uh, 220 uh, parts per million of hydrocarbon. This car passes just barely. Now let's see how much cleaner the emissions are from a new car that has a catalytic converter and a fuel-injected engine. Now that the catalytic converter has lit off, the hydrocarbons are 19, 18, and, and descending, and the carbon monoxide is 0 0.02, which is almost no carbon monoxide. I think you might have trouble trying to commit suicide with this car. You'd probably have to go and grab the tire iron and whack yourself on the head or it wouldn't go down. Today, a typical car gets 25 to 30 miles a gallon, and every major car company is now working to design engines that will get 50, 60, and even 80 miles to a gallon. 
But will even this be enough? Gas is, after all, a natural resource that will dry up. And no matter how fuel efficient a car becomes, the fuel it burns will still harm the Earth. So is there an alternative to the gasoline engine? Blue Mini just kind of, it's kind of a blue Mini. It's a nice car, but it's kind of a blue Mini because uh, unsuspecting Camaro V8s and Mustangs kind of get eaten alive by this car. So it's kind of a mean little electric that it's got some spunk to it. This is John Wayland, a builder of electric cars. John builds EVs by himself right out of his garage. He's one of those true believers who is committed to finding an alternative to the internal combustion engine. The first time I hit it, we burned rubber all the way out the driveway with the tires smoking. It twisted the drive line, cracked the transmission in half, and came to rest out in the street while all this fluid. I was going, oh, right, this is great, because I had no idea it had that much power. John is an inventor who put his money where his mouth is. This old Datsun is one of his cars. He removed its gas engine and replaced it with an electric one. What's interesting about the electric car, uh, because of the torque of the electric motor, you don't have to shift. Uh, this car is spirited and fun, but you can take off in high gear if you'd like. Um, you can take off in second gear, third gear. You can drive it like an automatic, or you can use the gears. And this particular car is performance oriented, so I like to use the gears because it's more fun. Uh, you get a little bit better acceleration that way. This is the voltage of my main traction pack, which shows that we've got lots of power. And this is the voltage of the accessory system, the 12 volt for the headlights, the horn, the wipers, and of course the sound system. The car is on, and yet there is no noise. Nothing's running, nothing's throbbing, spewing out emissions, heat. It's pretty unique. We're on right now? We're on right now. I hear nothing. You hear nothing. And then we just step on the accelerator and start moving. Silently, of course. When you come to a stop, all you can hear is the other cars making lots of noise. I can tell you it costs about one fifth of what it costs to run a gasoline car. It costs me about 30 cents to fill this up for 30 miles of driving. So compared to the cost of gasoline, that's about one-third to one-fourth. But then there's the issue of zero maintenance. There's really nothing to do with this car. There's no antifreeze, no oil, no filters, no tune-ups, no spark plugs, no mufflers. Heck, there isn't even an exhaust system. Love it. And it always runs the same. Whether it's snowing outside or it's sunny like today, it always runs good. It always has full power. Altitude doesn't affect it temperature doesn't affect the way the motor performs. Uh, electric vehicles are really wonderful. It's, uh, I always tell people, once you've driven an, in an EV, you'll never go back. And that's the way I feel about it. As attractive as electric cars might seem, the picture isn't perfect. The electric car gives up some of the flexibility you and I take for granted, like the ability to refuel it quickly, the ability to refuel it anywhere, the ability to drive it from here to God knows where on no notice at all. You can't do that in an electric. The laundry man that used to pick up my father's white shirts had an electric truck, and they do have a great advantage. But one of the things where, with the problems with electric vehicles, and I recall Lee Iacocca saying at uh, uh, the International Motor Press Association then and not too long ago, when he went to work for the Ford Motor Company as a young engineer, they had an electric vehicle. The biggest problem was they didn't have a battery. It's kind of funny how people are. Well, don't you have to plug it in? Like, it's a big deal. <laughs> and, and I always go, gee, I think it's a lot bigger deal to go to a gas station, get up from your house, drive somewhere, and pay some slob to pour gasoline over the side of your car. You know, no, this is really, really hard. Watch this. Really tough. You take the power cord, and you plug it in, you walk away. Car's now on charge. And we're drawing 11 amps out of the wall. That's about what a hair dryer would draw. But it does take John eight hours to fully charge this EV's batteries. Let's face it, today's motor car is very good. The electric vehicle or the hybrid car is not competing against replacing a horse and wagon. 
It's competing against a very good internal combustion car. Very affordable, meets all my needs, it's wonderful. John Whalen knows enough about EVs to turn just about any car into one. You're about to see him take this old Datsun, powered by an internal combustion engine, and perform what some call magic. This is what we call a diamond in the rough. This is a 1968 Datsun pickup that should be ready for the scrap heat. You can hear it's got a blown muffler, it's got exhaust leaks, but it's a cute, cool truck, and we're gonna turn it into something special. Uh, right now, it's uh, not that special. We have a, an old tech battery all full of corrosion. We have a greasy motor. So at the end of the day, she'll we be, gonna we're going to have an electric powered truck. Another nasty internal combustion engine component that's not needed. There it is. This is the happy moment when you go from greasy mess to refined, quiet power. This has one moving part. It has an armature that spins around, and that's it. Man, I need one of these hoists. Yeah. So we're getting close to it? Real close. Negative, positive, negative, positive. It's no longer internal combustion. Ready to roll. We've turned the corner and we're underway. The electric vehicle is here. She's alive! It's come out of the garage and it's going down the road. All right! All right. This time around, with the, the big players involved, GM, Toyota, Honda, Nissan, Ford, Chrysler, all building them, it's not a pipe dream anymore. This isn't like pie in the sky. We will have electric cars that go 250 and 300 miles on a charge that don't weigh like a battleship, that have room for your family, that accelerate well, that brake well, that do everything a gas power does, car does, except for pollute. The hybrid. It carries a gas engine and an electric engine side by side, both controlled by a sophisticated computer which decides how best to balance the gas power with the electric power. It's all designed to burn less fuel. Um, right here, this is the powertrain. This is the electric motor and it drives the wheels through this belt into the transmission. This is a normal five-speed transmission. This is a gasoline engine, which can be coupled to the transmission through a clutch right in this area. So we can drive as a pure electric vehicle, or we can couple the engine in and drive as a hybrid, therefore extending the range of the vehicle to a 300, 400 mile range. Our objective is 80 miles per gallon. We've gotten 50 miles per gallon. So what we want to do is get higher fuel economy, so we have to reduce the weight. And so comes this car. Now this car is completely made out of aluminum. Currently it's a 94 uh, Sable, Mercury Sable, but by the time we're finished with it, it will be a 1998 or 1999 Ford Taurus, and it won't look anything like it currently looks. We don't charge with gasoline. But on the highway, this car can still go a thousand miles on one charge. And one way to translate that is we can go from here, Sacramento, to Los Angeles, 400 miles away, up over mountains, and back on the same charge. So that's almost beyond the capability of human endurance for driving one day. <laughs> You're now in New York City, a driving nightmare but a great place to test new kinds of cars. You're about to see another alternative to an internal combustion engine, not an electric, not a hybrid, something else. Meet Silvio Martinez, a typical New York City cab driver, except for one thing. When he fills up the tank in his cab, it isn't with regular gasoline. Silvio uses something different. Smith. What no. is this? No, this is natural gas. Natural gas. Natural gas. Oh. <laughs> natural gas. <laughs> That's right, natural gas. The same type of gas some people use to heat their homes and cook their food. 
Silvio's taxi has been especially built to run on natural gas. He's part of a growing effort to use it. And why not? Okay. Thanks. So okay, bye-bye. It's cheap, and it is 50% less polluting than regular gasoline. Anjo. Yes. Do you know that you're running on a car or a CNG car? Compressor natural gas car? Sounds good to me. Who doesn't run on gasoline? You sure we're gonna make it all the way there? Every two yeah, thousand two knots. And two knots what every about two knots. Two knots the same. It's I can go one hundred thousand miles on this car. I pay for a gallon of gasoline about dollar fifty. Right. Using natural gas, you know how much I use? How no. much I pay? How much? Dollar fifteen. So maintaining the vehicle alone, you don't have to put so much effort as you do with gasoline. Right. You got that one right. I lived in London for several years and okay. the air there was so bad and the reason for that was that all the taxis are diesel. You make it a profit. Yes. Uh, it's healthy for the environment and yes. the planet. Yes. And see going. It's not the wow. Up from there. It's, like, it's just like just, just like uh, it's steam. steam. It's steam, steam. Yeah. absolutely. You smell it. It's nothing's coming out. Wow. Now it's smell it. It's nothing's coming out. I like that. It's <laughs> He didn't have to make any radical changes to use natural gas in his car. He still has to go to a gas station. So if natural gas is so great, why aren't we all driving around in natural gas vehicles? One obvious drawback, if you take a look in the trunk, is space. Natural gas tanks take up a lot of room. You'd think well, a cabbie would have a real problem with that. About, I don't mind having no space in the trunk because you have to give you have to to give something in order to receive. I'm receiving a lot of incentive on the car using natural gas. It's cheaper uh, to maintain the car. It's gonna cost me less money. For that reason, I give them something. I give them half of the space that I have in the trunk. Natural gas looks great on paper. It runs very well in cold weather because it doesn't have to turn to a gas. It is a gas. We have a lot of natural gas in this country. But if you go out and buy a car that will run only on natural gas and you want to drive it across country, you'll starve to death before you make it. Another reason natural gas cars have had a hard time selling is that many people think they're unsafe. They fear that a natural gas tank could explode. Are we any more likely to blow up if someone runs into us? No, no, we are... Less likely? No, 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 no. Don't think about <laughs> explode or something like that. No, this it's is New York. I'm in a taxi after all. Absolutely, but this is safe, very safe. One thing Silvio learned to trust is the safety of his natural gas tanks. Because something happened to him while out driving. Something scary. Just before 9 Thursday morning, bus driver Charles Austin lost control behind the wheel. Unconscious but still accelerating, he drove the bus down Fifth Avenue, barreling into a lamppost, taxi cab, a bicyclist, and a delivery man before crashing to a stop in this corner store. All that was left was mangled wreckage. I step out from the car and walk about five feet from the door of the car. In my back, a city bus lost control, hitting down Fifth Avenue, and the bus was traveling about 75 miles per hour when they hit the car and brought the car about one block away. The whole body of the car is destroyed, but all the tank had the same, nothing happened to the tanks. Because it is a vapor, not a liquid like regular gasoline, natural gas is stored under intense pressure that could spell trouble. But tank manufacturers believe that they've taken care of that problem. Natural gas cylinders are very durable. They're made out of uh, thick steel, they're covered with fiberglass, and we test them through all kinds of dramatic tests. They'll go through bonfires, we shoot bullets at them, they survive all of that. We joke around in the office that when, uh, when all of us are gone and the world is populated by cockroaches, they'll be sharing that world with natural gas cylinders because they'll still be here. The electric vehicle, the hybrid, the natural gas vehicle, more fuel-efficient internal combustion engines, engines that emit less pollution. All of these technologies serve to make things better, but they must get better still.
we're back in Los Angeles again at its air quality management headquarters. LA is cleaner than it once was, but is it clean enough? This is Dr. Rudy Eden, who tests the quality of the air in Los Angeles every 24 hours. The people of LA depend on him and what he's doing to protect their health. This sampler here is one of several that we have in the LA basin. We have 32 monitoring stations in the basin, and this particular one has been sampling for a 24 hour period. And what we'll do is we'll take it out of here and replace it with a clean white filter. And there's the differential. This is the amount of material that you'll get in the air over a typical 24 hour period. Um, it's, it's not necessarily what you want to see in the air, but it's what we have here in the LA area. These filters, when we've sampled probably 10 or 15 years ago, typically came out very, very dark, almost black. We don't see that anymore. These filters really have gotten a lot cleaner as the years have gone by and, and uh, pollution control has really worked out for us. These particles technically are called PM2.5. In more reasonable terms that you and I can understand, they're about a, a 25th of the diameter of a human hair, so they are very, very fine. The interest is because these will get lodged in your lungs and they do have health impacts. In fact, I remember when I was a kid in the 60s, I would drive in from out in the desert area, and I'd actually have my eyes water by the time we hit LA. That doesn't happen anymore, so it has improved. What goes on inside this catalytic converter is really quite exciting. To Things have improved, and you've just seen a few of the hundreds of thousands of people who have made this happen. But the challenges remain great. The time is short, and of course, it's not just up to them, it's also up to us. One of the problems that auto industry faces is that it appears that Americans really don't care about fuel economy. And it's not irrational for them not to care about fuel economy when gasoline is cheaper than water in the United States. People don't value fuel economy. They value size and acceleration. So we've now got things like a sport utility vehicle that will accelerate as fast as a Corvette did 15 years ago. They tend to buy the car for the maximum event, the annual drive to visit the in-laws in Florida, uh, towing the boat, whatever, and the other 364 days of the year drive around with more car than they need. People will buy dolphin-free tuna or toilet paper made from recycled paper, make other small compromises that may involve a few dollars or small lifestyle changes like bothering to haul the recycling out in the blue bin on Monday mornings for the truck, but they're less prone to make big compromises in their automobiles. Someday uh, you won't be able to give away an internal combustion engine and people will say, oil? What would I do with oil? I can't drink it. I can't make anything with it. God forbid I should want to burn it. Um, we're not there yet. Um, we got to get there. and. Uh, yes, the day will come when you can't give away fossil fuels. But uh, in order to get to that day, we have to make sure we don't destroy the planet first by doing the things that we can do today.